Okay, good, good morning, everybody. Um, just wait for the last to settle in. It's my very great pleasure to introduce this session um, today and I'm ready to welcome all of you here. We have an amazing array of, of talks. We've already had one in the plenary this morning by Professor Astrid Jar. Um, and it's my, re my real honor to present to you two wonderful young scientists in my group, um, Dr. Kelly Ortega Cisneros, Dr. Louise Gamage, who are really paving the way for um, marine science in South Africa now. And um, they are leading a, a wonderful transdisciplinary project, which you will hear a bit more about during the discussions. Um, but really today what we're wanting to do is to look at transdis transdisciplinary approaches to um, decision making for coastal communities, enabling them to adapt to, to change in general, but to climate change in particular. So I'm going to hand over to Kelly, who's going to be chairing for the first session. Um, thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, um, our next speakers, um, we have a double presentation. It's Maureen Trinka and uh, Cisco Werner. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, Maureen is first, yes. <laughs> Maureen Trinka, advisor for regulatory programs, and I'm here with Cisco Werner, chief science advisor and director for science programs, and we're here representing NOAA Fisheries to present the U.S. perspectives on evolving decision making under climate change, shifting marine ecosystems, and addressing management challenges. In March of 2023, the Biden-Harris administration developed the first ever whole of government ocean climate action plan to advance climate solutions, provo promote environmental justice, create good paying jobs, and ensure sustainable coastal communities and a healthy ocean economy. In particular, the plan calls out the role of fishery management councils, support for the highly vulnerable and underserved communities, and new science initiatives such as the NOAA Climate Ecosystems and Fisheries Initiative. As many of you know, fish stocks are migrating to the poles, and more will be doing so in the future. Pinsky et al. 2019 in Science details the unique management and science challenges that will result from these shifts across our governance systems. We've also seen many presentations over the past few days that further discuss this issue. But the scope and magnitude of this problem have remained unclear, and there have been few efforts to address these large issues. The United States manages a very diverse set of fisheries, 460 stocks in federal waters, ranging from our large-scale fisheries in Alaska to our small-scale artisanal and subsistence fisheries in our territories. Off the coast, within three miles, our various state, states manage their fisheries in state waters. On the Atlantic seaboard, the states come together in an interstate compact where they manage transboundary stocks within three miles of the coast. Outside of three miles, up to 200 miles, is federal management, and we manage within these eight color-coded regions. We have fishery management councils for each region. The council is made up of stakeholders, state representatives, and other non-federal persons, and they're appointed by the Secretary of Commerce, <coughs> excuse me, as um, received by nominations from each state governor. The councils provide us advice on things such as allocations, seasonality, and gear restrictions for stocks within their region. We have difficulty when stocks move outside of a particular council region. On the Atlantic coast, we're seeing a range shift of many stocks. One example is black sea bass. On the left, you can see in the 1970s, the landings were mostly off the coast of North Carolina in the southern portion of the colored area. And by 2018, the stock had moved northward to North New York and Southern Massachusetts. 
As the biomass shifted, that corresponded to a change in the landings. Where North Carolina used to be very high, and in the early 2000s, you see a shift of the landings, increasing in New York and Massachusetts, and a steady decrease in North Carolina. There are economic consequences for this shift. In federal waters, this is a capacity-controlled fishery. So you can only f fish for black sea bass if you have a permit, and there are barriers to buying the permit. So with this shift in stock, the people in the mid-Atlantic need to go north, which costs fuel, and it creates political issues because the fishermen off of New England cannot catch their local fish. Not only does this create a political issue, but it subsequently creates a bycatch issue because the people in New England do not have the permits for their local abundant fish, and so they must throw them overboard if caught. This also creates a community issue by removing landings from the historical ports in the mid-Atlantic, many of which are underserved and increasing landing in new port areas. Additional issues arise if you change the locations of the home ports. The home ports are the locations where there are ice houses, dockside services, boat repair services, all of those would need to shift as well. For governance systems in the US, as you'll recall from the slide before, North Carolina was in the mid-Atlantic region, whereas Massachusetts is in the New England region. So you are therefore crossing a governance boundary. This creates an allocation issue. How do you allow local fishermen to catch the fish where those states may not relinquish their permits that they currently hold? States may not believe that this shift is permanent, and so therefore they could be hesitant to relinquish their catch. Overall, this is a very complicated issue. It's a science issue, it's a governance issue, a social issue, and an economic issue. The same phenomenon is happening on the west coast of the United States. One example shown here is for Pacific sardines. This figure shows a predictive model where it predicts the locus of the stock and how it may shift. The black dots indicate the fishing ports for sardines from Oregon in the northern section down through the um, central part of California. The southern ports are going to be negatively impacted with this predicted shift in the stocks to the north. This example, however, will not have the jurisdictional issues as the prior example because this is one federally managed stock under one fishery management council. However, this stock would experience the same port dynamics as the prior example, but without the jurisdictional issues crossing into different management systems. So far, I've talked about some of the implications of shifting stocks, and it's happening right now in some areas. Right now, one of the things we can do is to better predict when these shifts are going to happen, what kind of shifts could happen, and then pre-plan what we can do if they happen. Both in the Atlantic and the Pacific, with our councils, we're engaging in scenario planning. We do a relatively good job of deciding what the possible future scenarios are, but what we struggle with is determining how we know when we are in that scenario. What is the trigger, and what do you do if the trigger is met? How do we address emerging fisheries? You need to include governance. We cannot appropriately plan for shifting stocks if we do not take into account the social, economic, and governance implications. We can't wait until it's too late. I'm now going to turn it over to Cisco to discuss how science is working to get at these questions and address some of these difficult problems. Thanks, Maureen, and um, <clears throat> good to see everybody. Um, the uh, social science and management side certainly makes the science a lot easier uh, by comparison. And that's a little bit what I'm going to be talking about today. And um, um, 
Maureen ended with this, with this discussion on, on scenario planning, and I'm going to build on the scenario planning discussion and come back to it at, at, at the end as we evolve in terms of how we think about scenario planning. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to get a little bit into the details of how the, some of the scenario planning happened and also where we're hoping to go into the future. There was a number of really good talks um, uh, at, at the meeting that talked not just about the management issues, but also about the... Um, uh, the community issues and the impact to communities. So I'll just jump straight ahead into the three science areas that, that I'll be covering that contribute to this discussion, this really important discussion. I'll talk a little bit about climate vulnerability analyses, socioeconomic indicators and how we couple them, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, how we're thinking about moving forward in projections of climate change through this climate ecosystem and fisheries initiatives. Yesterday, there was a really nice session on, um, on the climate vulnerability assessments as applied to um, world heritage sites and such. And so the idea of how do you incorporate all of these changes to protect, whether it's heritage sites or understand fisheries or other resource management issues is, is, is one that I think is quite mature. But I'll just go through um, the, how we do the climate vulnerability analysis that contribute to this scenario planning. And again, the scenario planning is a multi-year, multi-sectoral um, uh, discussion uh, that, that is taking place with, with, with people from local communities through management, uh, science, and everything in between. And so in this case, on the right side, um, what you see is the outcome of a, of, of a climate vulnerability analysis, in this case for the northeast coast of the United States, the same area that um, Maureen talked about. And the way this worked is that you pick in this case, the 82 stocks of both fish and invertebrate species that are commercially important, ecologically important, and such. And on the left side, you say, well, we know that things are happening. We know that climate is changing. There's changes in global temperature, precipitation, you know, CO2, et cetera, which translates into um, the physical chemical impacts on the ocean with temperature changes, stratification, sea level, you know, changes in salinity, acidification, and so on. And then in turn, those have, we know that there is a sense of, of well, how that affects the different species productivity, phenology, so when they show up, uh, species distribution, abundance, and so on. And so the idea here is to take these, these 82 species and take the best understanding. Again, it's, 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 it's sort of a, it's, it's somewhat quantitative, somewhat qualitative. Um, I kind of wonder if, if this is the uh, kind of approach that Mike Russ talked about this morning in terms of a Delphi meeting, in terms of understanding the, 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 the inputs as well as the variability of, a, of, of how we arrive at decisions. But you look at climate exposure and the biological sensitivity, and you can classify you know, how sensitive the different organisms might be as a result of both the magnitude in, in, in the possible magnitude in the climate exposure or change as well as their sensitivity to, to climate. And the different numbers say, you know, and there's, if you go all the way to the top right, there was one invertebrate, it was base scallops, um, which was particularly sensitive to, to climate change and is also biologically sensitive, so it's up in the far right. If you go down a little lower, you see, you know, different numbers that say how many invertebrates are in the different boxes. And the same exercise has been um, implemented in the various other parts of, of the United States. Uh, Maureen talked about the Pacific Coast. I think it's also moving to Alaska and, and the Pacific Islands. And it's a starting point for a, a, the, the, of the science that goes into, into the um, assessment of, of, of climate impact through the scenario planning. The second one uh, that I'll talk about is you can also think about it as climate vulnerability, but in this case, it's, it's it, uh, Lisa Colburn, who's here in the audience, and her team developed this really nice social indicator for coastal communities mapping tool. And it's available online, and, and you can go and, 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 and really explore it. It's really a wonderful site. And it has 14 indicators. It's been applied to 24 states, 4,600 communities. And the indicator categories are fishing dependence. You know, so it's looking at the different communities um, in terms of um, you know, how dependent are the, are, are, or not, say, on, on commercial fisheries or recreational fisheries. Um, environmental justice uh, uh, factors, so, you know, are the minority groups, you know, the, you know, how rich or, you know, the, 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 the how, you know, how wealthy a community might be. Uh, climate change could be storms or sea level rise, gentrification, which is, we know that a lot of people are moving to the coast, for example, and how does that impact those communities? You know, when you bring in, say, for example, retirees who are going to be part of the community and 
perhaps pay taxes and all that stuff, but they, not be, they might not become part of the workforce. They're looking for something else, but that in turn also impacts how that community is structured, as well as economic considerations in terms of, again, you know, how, how capable are, uh, you know, how, what the economic, uh, you know, well-being is of, of the communities there. And all of these are indicators that allow you to explore the different communities and, for example, say what happens if you bring in, um, you know, a, 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 a stressor, right? And so you look at social vulnerability. This allows you to see the pre-existing conditions, the resilience. Am I able to, 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 uh, you know, to absorb some of these, 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 these changes? And ultimately, the temporal evolution, how this, how this happens over time. And so this is an example where I'll combine, so you can combine, for example, the, uh, the, the, the climate vulnerability analysis there in the top left in terms of what we did with the species. And then you look and focus in and zoom in on these communities, again, along the east coast of the United States, or the New England coast of, of or Middle Atlantic and New England coast of the United States. And what you can see in this one example is that you can, the, there's a rich diversity in terms of how the communities might, might react uh, differently uh, to, the, um, uh, you know, to, to, to climate and other stressors combined with the, with the social information that we have. And Astrid this morning in, in her very nice talk also talked about this patchwork, if you will, of how the different communities, even though right next to each other, might actually be quite, you know, different levels of vulnerability to, to, to basically similar sensors in some ways, or stressors in some way. And in this case, I picked out two communities which are in that black ellipse, uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, and Point Judith, Rhode Island. And what you see here is that sea scallop, which is, again, as I, remember, I, I mentioned, is in the top right of that box there in terms of sensitivity to both climate and also biological sensitivity, makes that population or that community quite uh, at risk, you know, because you're basically, you're relying on, on a single uh, species that in turn happens to be quite sensitive to change. Whereas the other one, Port Judith, is basically is a diversified portfolio, if you will, in terms of what their dependence is on, um, on, on, the, on the marine resources. And so this allows a combination of scenario planning, of understanding how communities and, and decision makers within the communities and leaders and the population might decide on how they prepare for, for the future, how they think ahead as we think about what, what might be coming down the line. So speaking of what might be coming down the line, now the question then is how to evolve this to being a little bit more predictive. A lot of this work is, is, is built on a lot of internal knowledge, but our system is evolving. Our system is evolving from being stationary to non-stationary, and I'll just illustrate that with that figure there. That figure is northern hemisphere temperature over the last thousand years. And it, I put it there because it's one that I think we've all seen. And we know that for the better part of those thousand years, temperatures have been relatively average. Yes, there's been fluctuations, whether it's little ice ages or volcanoes or whatever it is, you know. We know there's fluctuations, but there's fluctuations about a mean. And if you have a mean, you can kind of plan around that. You, 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 know, what, you know that there'll be ups and downs, but on average, you know what's going to happen. The red part indicates the Industrial Revolution in this case, of course, and, and you see that it's not stationary. It's, it's changing. It's not a mean. Every, there's, not, there's no average anymore. And that's what non-stationarity means. It means that we now are in a condition where there is no average. The variance is changing. <clears throat> so statistically, we have to change the way we think. And many of our models of living marine resources, <clears throat> excuse me, LMR, were developed under these conditions of stationarity. So that's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty fundamental shift in terms of how we move from stationarity to non-stationarity. Yes, we included, say, random year-to-year -year fluctuations, but even, you know, in terms of how we define our reference points and so on, they assumed that there would be prevailing environmental conditions, which is no longer the case because we're in this non-stationary state. And in fact, there's really, there's some admission of regime shifts, but there's no real prescriptive advice in terms of what we do. So this Climate Ecosystem and Fisheries Initiative, in, in a cartoon way, I try to boil it down to a cartoon, one, non-stationarity is we have, to, we have to address it face on. And non-stationarity, again, there's the picture there, the, the green wiggles and the red wiggles. The, non, the stationary part is wiggles about a mean. The non-stationarity means that there is no mean and also that the amplitudes might be different, the frequency of when things might happen is different, so we're going into this different state. We need to know, and we need to be able to think about how we evolve that. Models are a way of trying to think ahead, and so we're 
putting a fair bit of effort into development of, of these models that are downscaled uh, global ocean models and, 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 and climate models down to local scales, um, combined with other things that I won't get into about right now. We need to evolve of it our advice. The picture in the bottom left is a well-known picture uh, on management strategy evaluations, and it's in some ways a scenario planning approach as well, where you get everybody together, different levels of input, different levels of knowledge, and you start with, say, forward projections of what the, system, the environment might be. You have the, the stakeholders at the table. You develop strategies, you build models, you come up with a ranking in terms of you know, the traffic light there, red, yellow, green, and you iterate as you learn. You, again, the term co-creation of knowledge and co-decision making is, I think, part of this thing quite implicitly, and it's been said a couple of times already in several of the talks here, and you develop the scenarios, the what-if scenarios. It's the same idea as the scenario planning that that Maureen talked about and Astrid talked about earlier, but you know, it's a little bit more quantitative. This is work from Kirsten Holzman, who's also, I think, here somewhere in the room. But it's an idea of how do we need to think into the future, and I stole this slide uh, from Eva Plagani, who at, at a meeting a couple of years ago presented it, and she said that we need to think about not managing for stability anymore, but managing for variability. So there's a lot of different ways things can go, and I think this is a, a message in terms of how we need to think about things in the future. And this is a pretty fundamental shift in terms of our management approach to how we do fisheries and including all of this, um, all of this information. This is basically the same slide as the one before, but more complicated. Um, and it just says, we're going to make ocean predictions that are, that are messy on the far left. And they're inclusive of everything from climate all the way to the social systems. We need to do that. We know we need to do that. We will have these decision support teams that will work on a number of aspects. This is, this is in some ways, quite transformational, uh, we hope, fingers crossed. Um, you know, there's going to be, we'll have to look at habitat changes, species forecasts and projections, ecosystem things, tipping points, which is really hard. All of these things are pretty hard, but we're, we're, we're going to have to take it on, as I said, not because it would be nice to know, but because we need to know them. And then we have, you know, to, to provide the advice, you know, to the, to the you know, the, 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 through population modelers, stock assessors, risk assessors, et cetera, to finally the application you know, more quantitative scenario planning, management strategies, uh, recovery, rebuilding plans, and all of that. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is a aspirational, but within the next five year project that we're, that we're taking on. Um, and so hopefully in, in the, at the next ECWO, uh, you know, we'll be able to report uh, on where we are on this. And, and to summarize, um, I'll just say that we know that the climate affects our regions um, and communities differently. Um, we talked about how patchwork they are and how even, even though they're just a few miles or kilometers away from each other, they can be vulnerable in different ways. We do need a, diff a suite of approaches. <clears throat> we're, we need to re-examine or examine our existing governance structure. In some ways, we're reinventing how science talks to management and management provides advice. And our aim, as I said, over the, last, over the next five years is to see how we come up with these robust management and, and uh, uh, approaches through CFI and other things. And this reminds me that at 3 or 3.30 today, the Supreme uh, Workshop is being held, which is basically this at an international level. It's part of the uh, UN Decade of Ocean Science. So if you can make it at 3.30 um, to the Supreme session, there will be a lot more detail on that. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and thanks everybody for the, for the opportunity. Cisco and Maureen, are there time for questions? Um, there we go. Hey, um, <laughs> thank you. I'm Emily Knight from the Lemfest Ocean Program. And I was just curious about, like, really the third bullet, the governance structure, and wondering if you could just say a little bit more about, like, how the science you're doing, how that connects to the council process, or, like, what some of those pathways might be? That's clearly you. <laughs> so we definitely rely on the science to make those informed decisions when it comes to management. So we do have scientists that work alongside with our councils to provide them that the data that they need to make their decisions. So we try and support those needs so that they can steer their decisions in the direction of where the things that are needed the most we can take care of. 
Um, but it's definitely difficult, right? When you're trying to work in a council process, you have a, a lot of different people trying to come together to make one decision. And that can be a long process, it can be a hard process, um, but we try and make sure that they're always using the best available science so they're fully armed with the information to be most informed when they make those management decisions that we can then implement. And I'll just add to the, uh, Maureen used a word process. It, it's a process, this won't be an event. It won't be like, oh, now all of a sudden we're switching from one way to doing something. It does require a lot of conversation. Maybe the kind of information we're providing is not the information they were asking for. And so that's that iterative part of the discussion that, that needs to happen um, in terms of, are we bringing the, the right science? Are we answering the right questions? And are there things that we're missing? Because there's a lot of things that are happening so quickly I meant to say this earlier, that some of what's going on out there is outpacing the, our ability and the science to keep up. So that conversation has to, we have to all to be coming with, with, you know, with, with our minds wide open to see what, how, we, how we evolve this process. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, what do you see as kind of the, um, main choke points and opportunities for NOAA in producing science that can be used by both managers and the communities where we uh, work and study. Um, if I understood you right, you're asking the how do we communicate at the, at the community level? I'm thinking like there's a massive amount of science that we're producing and kind of what are the choke points and opportunities for NOAA to yeah. Yeah, so, um, so the question is how do, we, how do we pass that information on in, 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 in the two ways with the communities. Um, uh, Maureen mentioned the councils. The councils, um, are, I'll describe briefly, it is a, it is a wide open process where uh, it's a public process where, where, we, where we present our science and, and also there's you know, either uh, constructive criticism or comments on, on what we do and also it's, it's an open invitation to bring things that perhaps we had not thought about. So the council process is a way of doing it. Other things that are happening right now is, for, for example, these scenario planning approaches where, where again, it's, it's a, it's a multi-sectoral open invitation to, to, to conversation. So I think, you know, or we hear it directly from the communities or industry and so on, but that conversation is actually uh, quite lively and getting livelier in a, in a good way. So it's, it's the, the mechanisms are there to have that conversation. Yeah. Um, this time for one more question. So when you start the, the, the presentation, you mentioned that the councils are fixed. So now we know that the species are moving around. So how flexible are going to be the councils in the future and the overlapping of the decisions in between? Right, so that's going to be a major challenge. Um, but it's a challenge we have to start thinking about because this is actually happening. Um, so we do have to find ways for the councils to work with each other. Um, Along the Atlantic Seaboard, we do have a compact where they do currently work together on species that are already the stocks are existing along the Atlantic Seaboard. But now we actually have to think more about those stocks that were originally in distinct regions and are now moving. And how do we get the councils to work together? Um, as Cisco mentioned, the council process is very public and transparent and open. And it's hugely important for the public to take part in that process, to speak up, to voice their opinions, to tell us what needs to be done. Um, and those people that sit on the councils are supposed to be the voice of the people, the voice of the stakeholders, the voice of the people who are benefiting from those fisheries. So it's a domino effect of information being fed up to the federal government. So it's hugely important that those people are showing up to the councils or speaking during their comment sessions um, so that we can be fully aware of what's going on and hopefully the councils will, will work together and vote in a way that they can find ways to benefit each other. We're modernizing both the science and the management at the same time, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think we thank need you. to move to the next presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is um, Megan Williams. Okay. Megan, okay, go ahead, thanks. Hi, 
can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, thumbs up? All right, good morning. My name is Megan Williams. I'm a fishery scientist with Ocean Conservancy in the Arctic program. And Kevin Whitworth from the Kuskokwim River Intertribal Fish Commission, who is getting mic'd up right now, is going to be co-presenting with me today. So I'm really excited to talk with you today about new tools to advance climate resilience in rural Alaskan communities. I also do want to acknowledge, um, in addition to Kevin and the Kuskokwim River Intertribal Fish Commission, um, I want, would like to acknowledge our other collaborators, so the Aleut community of St. Paul Island and the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. So as, as we've been hearing all week, um, and we, are, we heard again today, Climate change is exacerbating social and environmental justice and equity concerns for rural communities. And this is very true in Alaskan rural communities. And one of our proposed solutions is increased representation of community and ecosystem considerations in science and management using partnerships, co-production of knowledge, and better inclusion of local, traditional, and indigenous knowledge. And in this presentation, we use case studies that describe a dual approach, working both within and beyond traditional fishery management frameworks to begin addressing these equity issues um, and to try to build on ramps for some of these issues into fisheries management. And these are new ideas. The first one we'll discuss, I'll discuss, is the ecosystem matrix. And then Kevin is going to speak to the Chinook salmon conceptual model. So we just heard a lot about this, so I'll breeze through this. But um, both Kevin and I work in the Alaska region, primarily in the Bering Sea is our focus today. Federal fisheries are managed by these councils. And many important management decisions, especially setting ground fish harvest levels or catch levels, however you want to describe it annually, they are still primarily managed using a single species approach. And we argue that this primarily single species approach, especially for ground fish harvest levels, really overvalues economic incentives and concepts like maximum sustainable yield and undervalues broader ecosystem considerations and undervalues broader community considerations. And this is one of the reasons that we're experiencing these inequities in the region. Um, we also, of course, acknowledge that research really suggests strongly that climate change will exacerbate these inequities. And so that's what we wanted to talk with you about today. So jumping into this first, for this first um, concept is this ecosystem matrix concept. And ecosystem-based science and management is very advanced in the Alaska region in some ways, and, but it tends to focus on what are the ecosystem impacts driving fishery productivity? What are the ecosystem impacts driving fishery profits? And we intentionally really wanted to flip that by looking at what are some of the impacts of the fishery on the ecosystem? What are some of the impacts of the fishery on the communities? So we did a qualitative and quantitative assessment of the fishery impacts on associated ecosystem attributes or indicators. Um, and I, I'll say that this was a collaboration with other NGOs, with other tribes through, across the Alaska region. And so we synthesized the most current research and we also, importantly, included multiple ways of knowing. So Western, the most recent Western science and the most recent um, tribal reports, indigenous knowledge, to try to get a really diverse perspective. And so this is a really quick, and I do not expect anyone to read this because that's insane. Um, but this is what the synthesis looked like. And this kind of a sort of report card format can be useful in thinking about ways to reframe the focus of certain management objectives or out outputs. Now, because I'm not crazy, I'd say let's focus in on one example here. And so we'll look at this example of the Pollock fishery. Um, and this is looking at the Pollock fishery flushed out a little bit um, and impacts on the ecosystem. Again, we are not trying to imply causation, correlation. This is based on, you know, from the communities, some of the concerns. Um, we looked at associated predator species trends. So an example here would be northern fur seals. And this is 
and in that they're very reliant on both adult and juvenile pollock. They're also an important subsistence use species, and they have been experiencing a decline since about 2004. We looked at associated bycatch species, so just bycatch species associated with the pollock fishery. We looked at Pacific cod for its importance by weight. We also looked at um, salmon as a bycatch species for its sociocultural importance. And so if we jump right again, we also looked at subsistence. Um, and salmon is something that Kevin will be talking about in more detail, but I'll just flag in, in this matrix, we're able to emphasize that communities across Alaska, especially Western Alaska, are very concerned about salmon bycatch in the pollock fishery. Um, moving on and not dropping too deep into this, we also looked at community, net neutral habitat, um, and, and sort of tried to rank some of these considerations, and of course, climate considerations. And so this is you know, pretty transparent, it's pretty intuitive compared to some of the other approaches. And, but what we really wanna do is link these to management outcomes. And as part of that, we took this concept to a working group at the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Um, we're currently drafting a manuscript for peer review. And then we also are hoping to include this type of a framework in an upcoming scenario planning workshop. So we're trying to think about how to take something that was developed outside the council by stakeholders and integrate it meaningfully into the management process to inform management outcomes and sort of what could this look like. So for instance, reducing pollock harvest near primary northern fur seal rookeries ties into predators, subsistence, and community. Additional restrictions on salmon bycatch. If you're in the region, this is, this is, these are conversations that are happening right now. This ties into a number of factors that we've considered in the matrix in different ways than you would conventionally. And then climate or ecosystem adjusted harvest control rules or overall ecosystem caps. And when you look at this holistically, you can see really what questions can we and can't we solve for with various management tools. And also I think you can really see the value of new ways of thinking about this, you, working with stakeholders, working with tribes to really elevate some of the concerns that it's tough to get from the ground up communicated in science and management. And with that, I'm excited to turn it over to Kevin Whitworth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to have to cruise here. Kevin Whitworth, Executive Director for the Kuskokwim River Intertribal Fish Commission. Uh, I'm from McGrath, Alaska. We represent 33 tribes in the Kuskokwim River from the Kuskokwim Bay all the way up to the headwaters of the Kuskokwim River. I'm indigenous, Degaton Athabascan, member of McGrath Native Village. Lived there practically all my life. My family's lived in Western Alaska for thousands of years. That's where we subsist. We hunt fish, subsist, and try to maintain our lifestyle uh, off the waters and lands of the, of the area. And so this graphic here shows the subsistence harvest over the, for Chinook salmon over the past 10 years, or actually goes back to 1978. But for the past 10 years, we haven't met our subsistence needs for Chinook salmon. It's called ANS. This is a matrix that the uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game puts out. And this is, this is a sad reality, but uh, it's, 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 it's out there. So the importance of salmon goes way beyond nutrition. It's a way of life. It's, uh, it's um, a social uh, activity where you're teaching your kids how to dry fish, how to preserve fish. Um, it goes back more than just nutrition. The causes of the Chinook, the Chinook salmon decline, it's not really well known, but we just need to take a holistic approach here, and that's what we're doing here today. And what we like to call this on the river is a gravel-to-gravel -gravel approach to management. It's an ecosystem approach from where the salmon are born all the way out to the ocean where they migrate, and when they come back to the river system to spawn. We need to think about all of the life stages of the Chinook salmon and how the impacts are on each, each stage, including traditional knowledge, so we'll add that to our matrix here. This is real busy. I'll dissect this a little bit more. So uh, this is the ecosystem report contribution, looking at the full scope of the salmon life cycle. You guys all probably know the salmon life cycle. Things that consider science and management should 
consider cumulative threats throughout life history, climate change, bycatch, disease, when, management sam when managing salmon, and other species. So this is, a, this is number one, spawner and eggs. What we found is uh, the marine heat wave conditions prior to the run, stressful river uh, temperatures decrease body size. There's about 30 to 40 percent decrease in the body size the amount of eggs in females, so there's a lot less eggs going into the gravel. And when you want to try to recover the species, less eggs is not helpful. I've got a really cruise here. We've seen in the fry, come when they're out migrating from the river, uh, not very good conditions in river 2017, 2018. Uh, low summer water levels, continued warm river conditions. So once these juveniles get out to the ocean, what we're finding is there's, uh, it's not good. We're in the red here still. Large marine heat waves, empty stomachs, weakened, uh, uh, weakened conditions. The immatures here, they get out into the ocean. They're trying to get bigger, get up into the rivers. We're, what we're finding is uh, they're having a hard time getting through some of the fisheries. So they're not getting up into the spawning grounds. When we try to recover the species, we need to do everything we can to get as much species, much individuals up into the spawning grounds. So we have area M fisheries and intercept fishery for Chinook salmon and also bycatch on the, the Pollock fishery. This is hurt in Western Alaska. Maturing adults. We did, this is a positive actually in 2021, we did see back to normal conditions for the ocean and in river, but what we're finding is that the return to the river was very low. Uh, Yukon River, for instance, they had zero openers for, for the past three years for subsistence harvest. No, no uh, subsistence harvest on Chinook salmon in the Yukon River. Very little uh, subsistence harvest on the Kuskokwim River. We're not meeting our escapement goals in some systems. Not good outlook for Chinook salmon. Where am I at? Uh-oh. So in conclusion, these types of conceptual models should be used for other species in, in, addition, in additional management contexts. It is essential that scientists and managers use existing and emerging management tools that prioritize equity and climate resilience as key components of climate resilience fisheries management. Science and management should place more emphasis on ecosystem and community resilience over economic incentives. These will increase fisheries sustainability in the face of climate change. New tools should be informed with transparency, co-production, and collaboration with other, in others. The only way we're going to get Chinook salmon back into the system and recover is we got to work together. That's basically what we're doing here. We're trying to work together, look at it, a gravel-to-gravel -gravel approach to this issue and try to recover the species, whether that's NOAA, Fish and Game, USGS, tribes. We've heard it a lot through this entire meeting, working with local people uh, to try to recover these species. So I'll leave it at that. Anabasi, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. We have time for a very quick question. Um, and I don't see anyone raising their hands. Here. Okay. You gonna take it? Hi. Uh, nice presentation. Um, wondering if the CO2 emissions continue like that. What is your prediction in time of decline completely of salmon in the area? This, did you say CO2 conditions? Yes. Go ahead. I, I think it, that, that highlights, so I mean, so our understanding of how climate might impact salmon returns is still being formed. But what we found is that during the warmest conditions, so as Kevin was talking about, with, when, with the continued warming, we expect to see sort of dietary challenges, um, nutrition challenges for a number of species of salmon, Chinook in particular, and chum salmon. So they, in those really warm years, they were coming back with weakened body condition and lower, um, lower, they were eating lower quality prey. And so I think, in my mind, in continued CO2 emissions, if, if that results in this continued warming, then we can expect to see additional challenges for salmon, for the communities that depend on them. And so I think it just spotlights just how critical it is that we address this issue now. 
if I can add just a little bit to that, so not based on, on CO2, your question there, but um, as far as the warming of the rivers go, in 2019, an example of that, 2019 we had major die-offs, chum salmon and chinook salmon, before pre-spawning, so they had eggs in, their, in them, and uh, I had a net out, and when you're fishing with the net in that time of war warm conditions, as the, river, as the fish come up into the rivers, their bodies are warming up, and, and uh, when you catch them, you basically cook them. They're not good for subsistence uses. They're good for the garden, they're good for feeding your dog team, so we had to quit fishing. It was just too warm. Um, so, and we don't know what the trend's gonna be as far as the rivers go, and, and if there's, you know, places in the river system that are refugia, like uh, spring water spawning areas and all that sort of stuff, but the migration areas are being affected too by climate change. CO2. I mean. Thank you very much. We need to move to the next presentation. Um, our next speaker is Jason Hartog, who is presenting on behalf of Alistair Hopday. There we go. Okay. Super. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Uh, yeah, like I was just introduced, I'm speaking for Alistair. Uh, he's online, uh, so if you've got questions, please do use the app to uh, deliver some questions to him. I'm happy to take questions at the end as well. Um, so in times of rapid change and rising human pressures on marine systems, information about the future state of the ocean can provide decision makers with time to avoid adverse impacts and maximise opportunities. Um, an ecological forecast predicts changes in ecosystems and its components due to environmental forcing such as climate change, climate variability, extreme weather conditions, pollution or habitat change. In this presentation, I'm going to summarise some examples from several sectors and a range of locations. Uh, sorry, I should say, um, I didn't make up that definition, Sun et al., uh, NOAA on the uh, ocean, uh, for ocean Service Eco Forecasting page. Um, looking backwards, uh, in 2017, Payne um, uh, uh, published this work showing where eco forecasts were being used uh, globally. And you can see it's quite limited, a bit around North America, a bit around Australia, a bit on the southern coast of Africa. Um, so what, we've, what we'd like to talk about uh, today is um, some changes in, uh, in this... Uh, 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 how many places around the world we're doing it, uh, different kinds of eco-forecasting. So um, I'm going to be taking you through uh, the, the need, the approach, uh, the performance and the delivery system we've used and how these um, forecasts have been uh, uptaken by our end users or stakeholders. Um, so I'll look at it in this uh, kind of format. We're going to talk about the method. Uh, we'll talk about whether it was a nowcast or a forecast, and if it was a forecast, what was the lead time, uh, the way we actually delivered uh, these forecasts to our end users. Um, so that takes a variety. It could be an email, it could be a website, it could be a, um, a report or a publication. Um, and we also want to think about whether this is actually these things become part of a broader information system, uh, where they're actually um, in. Uh, in, be in, be in embedded in the um, decision-making space of the particular businesses we're using. Um, and then also some comment on how the uptake was. So firstly, I'd like to just go back to our oldest example. Many of you in the room may have seen these schematics, so I'll go pretty quickly. Uh, but the first example there was on Southern Bluefin Tuna uh, from the early 2000s to uh, 2016. Um, and what we were doing was taking our archival tag records, incorporating environmental data, SST, and temperature at depth from ocean models to pr provide a uh, habitat forecast. That forecast was delivered to our managers uh, in the hope that they would be able to set uh, boundaries for um, fishing locations in the hope of avoiding uh, unwanted bycatch of southern bluefin tuna. Bluefin tuna being a quota managed species, uh, so we wanted to avoid those unnecessary interactions. And we added a seasonal uh, component to that where we took a um, uh, the Bureau of Meteorology's model uh, and forecast out to six months, noting that there was skill to probably three to four months. 
Um, so the, the idea there is basically we've taken um, environmental data, made a forecast, given it to managers, they've made a decision, and then uh, we would do that on a fortnightly or monthly basis. Uh, moving forward, uh, recently we've completed a, a project where we're looking at multi-species uh, fishery on the east coast of Australia and in the wider western central Pacific, uh, Panel D. Um, it's not yet operational, but we looked at um, five different species, a whole, a whole suite of different um, environmental variables from uh, ocean reanalysis uh, to come up with uh, habitat or availability predictions in that space. Uh, another example of bluefin, this is in the uh, South Australian context, a juvenile fishery, uh, where, where industry were interested in the um, timing of the arrival of age two and age three to four fish into their uh, region. Um, so they operate in here, and so they're looking for when these leading edges of um, suitable habitat come close enough or around, the, around Kangaroo Island down the south here that they can take their um, uh, purse sainers and tow cages out into that area and not have to move too far for catching fish. So this, we've got a uh, industry representative in uh, Port Lincoln that is our kind of interface to this industry. And we also have it operationally uh, delivered on a website uh, in, indicated below. So in summary, um, the uh, spatial forecasts have been uh, most common. Uh, there's a clear link between uh, these species and the distribution. Uh, we've been working mainly in, on pelagic species, uh, and so that's, um, they have uh, the ability to um, move quickly. Um, and so they're a pretty good uh, candidate for these ecological forecasts. In the future, um, the, it's been identified that seasonal timescales are pretty useful for managers in, these, uh, in this um, space. Um, and we also note that we try not to be uh, fish finders. Uh, we're working to uh, limit <laughs> uh, unnecessary catch in many cases, and we don't want to be over-exploiting. So we approach this pretty carefully. Um, moving on to uh, another uh, area on the west coast of Tasmania. Uh, the modelling system deployed in Macquarie Harbour provided a water quality forecast to support uh, strategic planning and tactical operational uh, decisions for uh, these aquaculture businesses. Uh, circulation in the harbour is strongly uh, modulated by river flow, which was estimated from rainfall scaled against a historical time series of river flow uh, data. And a useful improvement to the study would be to include uh, a catchment model, uh, including these episodic dam discharge, uh, for more reliable prediction of river flow. Uh, further development to the system could provide extended forecasts at seasonal timescales and for future climate change scenarios, thus informing our long-term planning of salmon industry operations. Uh, so um, I'll go, I've got to go quickly now. Um, in summary, you can read that yourself, but in terms of the future, uh, there's strong demand. Uh, there's, there's interest in all different timescales, both uh, decision-making the, in the real time, in the next couple of weeks, uh, seasonal and long-term. Um, but these uh, nearshore environments are particularly complex, so we need to have better models to uh, uh, correctly capture these embayments. Um, another area we've looked at uh, is um, in uh, harmful algal blooms in the Yellow Sea. Uh, so we used uh, satellite uh, remote sensing data to identify these floating macroalgal blooms and then used a data assimilating model, uh, general circulation model, sorry, for the Yellow Sea to successfully predict uh, these drift trajectories, uh, giving a, a seven, about a seven day uh, lead time. Uh, so this is actually, there was a lot of interest in this. Um, in the real time to week is most interesting for many people operating in this space. Um, one problem we've noticed is no single client, so we don't have any money for development. Um, it requires lots of in situ data or satellite detection. Um, so there's, there's future here, but we need to, um, to work to uh, get these things operational. Um, another example we've, ha we've got is um, on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, so Crown of Thorns uh, is experienced, uh, the, sorry, the Great Barrier Reef is now experienced its fourth uh, starfish outbreak since the 60s. Uh, mortality due to cots is likely to continue to be one of the largest uh, contributors to coral decline in the GBR. And given that it'll be decades before global warming is halted or reversed, uh, reducing predation on corals by direct action uh, to cull these um, starfish is still the most effective means to prevent loss of coral cover over short timescales. 
Uh, so this uh, here is a, a, a plot of like threat potential, so uh, giving uh, managers and operators um, ideas of where to go to look and to do their interventions. And here's a, um, a like the you know the what's going on in the decadal uh, space about how, all the sorts of things you might do if you don't do anything, if you do something. So it's kind of like showing it's, it's worth doing something. Um, this uh, particular example here is trying to um, deliver um, uh, beach warnings of uh, jellyfish. Uh, Irukandji stings um, was modelled uh, based on uh, the, the environment. Um, sorry, a, a G GLM was um, uh, used with a response variable uh, was stings per day and several environmental predictors uh, as the predictor. So we're um, able to um, run this model and give uh, ideas of how you might set beach closures based on the current environment um, and the, the seasonal f uh, flow of or seasonal uh, pattern of stings. Um, so in summary, for these ones, there's great interest. Again, no single client uh, for development, even for COTS, it's a it's a big it's a big um, area. Um, we, we, what we need is. Um, an agency often to kind of be the, the host and the decision maker uh, and the platform for delivery uh, needs to be developed for these diverse groups. So what have we learned? Um, this examination shows that near-term ecological forecasts are needed by end users. Uh, decisions are being made based on forecasts and there is an urgent need uh, to develop operational information systems to support sustainable ocean management. Um, an operational information system is critical for connecting uh, decision makers and providing an enduring approach to forecasting and pro proactive decision making. Because unfortunately when our projects finish, then what happens? We've got to uh, think a little bit more uh, uh, cleverly about how to have enduring nature to these things. Um, so, just a couple of minutes. Um, so, uh, I guess... Uh, these operational systems, uh, they do require significant investment and ongoing maintenance, uh, but are key to delivering ecological forecasts for societal benefits. Uh, iterative forecasting practices uh, could provide continuous improvement by incorporating uh, evaluation and feedback to overcome the limitations of the imperfect model and incomplete obs observations to achieve better forecast outcomes and accuracy. Uh, so in terms of where these... Uh, where it's being uh, used. So we've got the, uh, these groups of eco forecasts. So Canada's got one from 2021 to the present. Uh, there's this group called uh, Oceana that uh, started last year. Um, and we've got like uh, regular monthly seminars. Um, Steph, May 25th, I think you're giving a talk. Is that right? She's here. Yes. Yep. So you can. Um, you can register for that if you want to hear Steph's talk. It's a it's free open, uh, open group, uh, so we welcome uh, yeah, people to uh, get on board. Um, if you want more details of the information in this talk, uh, I encourage you to get this paper by uh, Shelljo and Alastair and a bunch of others. Um, the details are there. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jason. Um, any questions for Jason or Falister? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you might have answered this in the end that it might just be a lack of money, but I was intrigued by the programs that ended and why they ended and maybe what lessons were learned, especially that bluefin example, because yep. you actually did one in the south afterwards. So if you, if you can talk briefly. Yeah, sure. So um, the bluefin one was a great uh, uh, example of what we were doing when there was nothing else that could be done. So they actually, the, the management agency uh, changed their procedure. They got um, uh, cameras on the all the boats and they were doing random uh, samples of, so they didn't necessarily need to be restrictive in where people went because uh, things were going to be looked at. Um, log you know, all that uh, compliance improved dramatically when that happened. Yep. Ah, there we go. Thanks. I know one of the things your team has worked on a lot in the past is the ethical dimensions and potential unexpected social consequences mm -hmm. of making these forecasts public. Can you talk a little bit about whether that was a consideration in any of these studies and kind of your additional lessons learned on that topic since 
the past few years? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, in terms of uh, ethics, uh, we did write a paper on, from the last um, ECWO uh, uh, meeting. Um, so, in, uh, assessing skill, super important. Don't make a forecast if you've got <laughs> no skill. Um, working with, uh, don't just, our, our ethically, don't just lob it over the fence and hope for the best. Sort of engage with either a champion in your industry or uh, have those uh, really deep uh, hooks into the decision making process so you can be involved along the way, I guess, is the, the couple of key points there. Thank you, Jason. Now we need to move to the next presentation. And our last speaker for this morning session is Lisa Colbert. So thank you, co-conveners, for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I, and I also want to thank Cisco and Maureen for teeing up uh, part of this talk. You're probably cutting off about two minutes, so we'll get out for lunch on time. Uh, this project is about predicting the adaptive capacity of uh, uh, fishing communities to changing ocean conditions, but using the Atlantic sea scallop fishery in the Northeast U United States as a case study. We accept that adaptive capacity is key to climate resilience and that social and ecological factors can both constrain and facilitate adaptation. In this study, we explore uh, the social ecological system of the Atlantic sea scallop fishery through a series of types of analysis that span examining the social conditions in the scallop fishery, in communities, the changing spatial footprint, um, diversification and specialization in the fishery, as well as it port interdependent interdependencies and talking to the fishing industry about their perceptions of adaptation and change. But first, a little background on the Atlantic Sea Scallop Fishery. It's managed over uh, 11 states in the Northeast United States with an economic value uh, on average uh, close to $500 million annually. And the importance of sea scallops, of course, uh, varies in terms of community dependency across the region, but is evolving and changing over time. We know that, uh, based on some of the information that uh, Cisco shared, that sea scallops are highly dependent, I mean, highly vulnerable to ocean acidification and warming. And what we are seeing in terms of uh, the climate and management is we're seeing landings move northward as well as biomass. We use the NOAA Fisheries Community Social Vulnerability Indicators to understand the social conditions in fishing communities. These indicators, as Cisco uh, mentioned, span looking at the overall dependence of communities on uh, sea scallops, looking at environmental justice concerns, what are the social vulnerabilities in, in these communities, gentrification pressure, which is key to the survival of, um, well, it's, it's contraindicated to the survival of a healthy commercial infrastructure, as well as we have some climate change risk indicators already that look at uh, sea level rise and storm surge in port communities. So there are, there are three guiding questions to this uh, particular, uh, the social science component of the project, which is how have, scallop, uh, how have scallop fishing communities and the industry adapted to change in the past? And how might understanding the past inform future resilience for this industry? And also, what are the perceptions of the industry in terms of uh, their perceptions of how they might adapt moving forward? This project is part of a, a transdisciplinary project, uh, including oceanographers, biologists, ecologists, and more. There are over 10 people on the team, and two of them are here today. Uh, Sam Slide three are here today. Sam Sledecki, I think Hallie's here, and Becca Selden um, have all contributed to aspects of the project. 
The, in terms of the social science component of the project, we use oral histories to understand the industry perceptions. We use industry workshops, uh, interactive industry workshops to exchange knowledge, both in terms of sharing information about um, uh, ocean acidification and warming with the industry, but also getting feedback from them on information they would like to understand. We have the socioeconomic community metrics that I mentioned, the social indicators, as well as landings data. We're using landings data um, analysis as a very important part of looking at historical behavior in the fishery. And we integrate and consider management history in this. This is a, a, an image of uh, four years over about a 25-year period. Uh, it, it illustrates the, um, I'm sorry, the footprint, change in the footprint of the fishing effort for the scallop fishery. Just a quick look at the lower left uh, map. You can see that uh, the, the effort is in the southern region of the northeast, and if you have a peak all the way up at the right, you can see that it's moved more and, and more concentrated in the northern area. This is uh, an illustration from the Port of New Bedford, which was uh, one of the pie, pie, uh, the pie chart that um, Cisco used. It's the, um, it's the largest or the most profitable port on the Northeast in terms of revenue and also the highest grossing port in terms of revenue in the United States. What you can see if you look at the red bars are an increase in dependence, both in terms of volume on the left and revenue on the right over about a 25 year period, increase in the dependence on scallops. And uh, simultaneously, um, the black line in is an indication of the, the decrease in catch composition diversity over time. But New Bedford exists in a larger context of other fishing communities, uh, many of which in the Northeast um, fish for scallops. Red here, uh, the red bars also indicate uh, scallops. And this is a look at the diversity in revenue for some other ports uh, that are linked with New Bedford. And you can see in the upper left, again, uh, declining uh, diversity in terms of revenue over the same time period. And in the bottom left, there are three communities that have pretty consistent um, a harvest or a revenue from scallops, and that has there hasn't been a lot of history of diversity in those communities, very dependent on scallops. And then we have some communities that uh, have a small amount of revenue um, that are uh, from scallops, but it's a very important part of the overall catch diversity for that commu those communities. But you can even see there that uh, catch composition diversity is declining. So here uh, on the left is, uh, the story is the, uh, and this is for the port of New Bedford again, are changes in um, where the, the landings come from. Uh, for many years, the port of New Bedford, uh, uh, had most of the vessels that were home ported there landed there, used it as their primary port but the blue line suggests that there's a decrease in the number of vessels in New Bedford that both home port there and land there, a decreasing trend. While the red line uh, indicates that there are, are vessels from elsewhere that are increasingly landing, um, increasingly landing in New Bedford, um, which uh, as uh, the Cisco's pie chart indicated, um, uh, the landings on any given year, I mean the revenue on any given year, um, sea scallops uh, are about 84%. Um, so it's very significant um, in terms of the landings, the contribution of the fishery to the community. And, um, and this is uh, another image of the percent of, of trips uh, that are increasing uh, on vessels from, from different communities that also utilize uh, New Bedford, land in New Bedford. 
So these port interdependencies are increasingly an adaptive strategy uh, that we, I hadn't really thought about at the beginning of this project. Uh, but uh, we're seeing now that the shift in New Bedford in order to continue to be resilient is dependent on other um, ports, vessels from other ports. We also are looking at, as I mentioned, we're using oral histories to understand the perception uh, of the perception of perceptions of the industry in terms of how to adapt. And understanding perceptions is very important because perceptions and behavior influence adaptation and the choices people will make. So uh, some of the uh, global um, uh, themes that are emerging include uh, uh, industry uh, wanting to diversify, that's not everybody, but some uh, vessel owners and captains are talking about the need to diversify or the desire to do so. And then there are different kinds of competing forces of change, such as offshore wind and uh, shoreside, uh, changes in shoreside infrastructure because of the shift of uh, vessels to other ports, as well as there's a frequent emphasis on, uh, on the ability to pivot and change. And uh, in the, the long time I have been working with fishermen, I've always thought of them as some of the most adaptable people um, that I have ever known. And their emphasis is on trying to continue to be adaptable and, and successful in what they do. So in the words of some of the fishing industry, I want to be more diversified in species. That's why we got out of full-time scalloping, because if everything goes perfect, it works, but what if it doesn't? And climate change impacts are not on the forefront of everybody's mind. They're thinking about things like offshore wind that are obviously very apparent. Everyone's talking about it. And in terms of closures in the southern part of the region, uh, one, uh, one person was concerned about losing the welder uh, which is part of the, the critical infrastructure because the vessels are landing uh, few, uh, much less there. They're going to New Bedford. And last, we want to have something else which may or may not be as profitable, but at least create some resiliency towards the downturns. And this was talked about yesterday in some of the session nine talks, is about the willingness to do something else or to change in order to continue to fish. So where is this going? The next step is moving beyond individual indicators and individual analyses that I've shared with you today to synthesis, both synthesis of the social component of this project in and of itself, but also working with a transdisciplinary team to integrate the social into the larger transdisciplinary product. So, um, and I think transdisciplinary research is very aspirational, and we hope to create a new, a new conceptual framework and new knowledge in the process of this work. So a few takeaways. Scallop ports can exhibit similar commercial reliance on the fishery, but vastly different social vulnerability, and this uh, varies across the region and across fisheries. And the fleet shows the capacity to respond to environmental and management changes, but also across ports, specialization in the fishery is increasing. And also the port interdependencies are both a, a vulnerability and a potential sign of adaptation and resilience. And last, fishermen express interest in diversification, but meet with competing forces of change. So when you look at, we look at a lot of these time series of landings, and we're talking about uh, species uh, moving northward, uh, it's not, we can't ever just attribute it to climate change. There's other things going on that also need to be considered in that process. And with that, again, I want to acknowledge um, my co-collaborators, in the project, it's a, it's a three-year project funded by the NOAA Office of uh, uh, Ocean Acidification Program Office. And uh, with that, I'll open it to questions.
Thank you, Lisa. We have time for a quick question. Do I see any hands? Okay. Um, thank you, Lisa, for a really cool talk. Um, I'm curious if you could, um, if you have any insight on uh, the demographics in this fishery and sort of the, if there's like a graying of the fleet and if that um, has impacts for how you think about sort of future adaptation, are there younger fishers doing different things getting into this fishery or not and what does that uh, mean for resilience? I'm really glad you asked that question. I wasn't sure I could squeeze that in. But um, the, 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 this particular fishery is, uh, some would consider, uh, in terms of management, successful, uh, fairly successful, and a healthy fishery. And it's also highly profitable. So uh, in studies in the northeast of crew, um, we've done uh, uh, several studies uh, over a 10-year period, uh, gathering demographic information from crew. Uh, what we found is, is that they're younger, uh, the, the average age of crew is younger by a quite substantial amount, um, and uh, that trend seems to be continuing for the Atlantic sea scallop fishery. Other fisheries, the, the trend is the at, at rising age of fishermen, but here um, it appears to be um, about five years um, below the overall regional average age. And I think that's a, that's a real good sign. Um. Thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, is there any other questions? Okay. We'll let you squeeze one. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Fantastic presentation. Um, on, on net, is, all, uh, is the possibility of all fishers diversifying and looking for other species an actual maladaptive strategy? Um, I know we're looking for fishers to diversify in a positive light, but it's also got implications in a, um, an ecosystem context. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I mean, I would agree with you. If there's um, continued decline in species diversity, it could, it could lead to over-exploitation of the species that are available. Um, so it, that's a very good point. Um, great. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to all of You're the speakers welcome. of this morning. Um, our session continues this afternoon, so we hope to see you then. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> thank you for joining us for this afternoon session. Um, we've got three more talks coming up, and then we've got a, some, time for some discussion, which is really nice. Um, our first talk is Emily Ogier from the Institute for Marine and Arctic Studies in Australia. So over to you, Emily. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Louise. And thank you, conveners um, of the, for the opportunity, oh, sorry, the conference, the opportunity to come and talk today. So I'm presenting, in fact, on behalf of the CSIRO, which is not where I work, but um, an agency I'm a collaborator with. And we're presenting today on a suite of tools we've developed for the adaptation of, of, uh, um, adaptation of fisheries to address climate risks. Um, and I'm going to present you with a little bit about the tools, but more particularly some of the insights we've learned in application and in diffusion. Um, thinking ahead to how we can continue this, this tool work and the, and the task of decision support and science policy most effectively into the future. But I'd like to acknowledge that my colleagues um, in developing, uh, who, who essentially drove this project. So the tool I'm speaking of, it's all about tools in this session, is essentially a handbook and embedded in that handbook and also in the app is a vulnerability slash risk assessment tool. Um, and then a suite of supporting tools to collect some of the data and extend some of the aspects of the tool. It's potentially quite a sophisticated set of tools, but we've certainly developed it with a series of um, passes. So it can, it can be operated as quite a simple tool, largely based on qualitative or expert information. But, it, but I won't go into a lot of technical detail about the tools, but I really encourage you to follow up with those links to look at them 
and also many of the colleagues who developed this tool um, with me, Beth Fulton namely, are um, online and participating in the ECHO conference. So the logic that we ran that existed behind this tool is that of social learning. So we did have, there was no formal mandatory context for operating a risk assessment of Australia's, in, in the first instance, Commonwealth managed fisheries to climate adaptation. We were doing an exploratory development of a decision support tool to start to address this emerging need. And the logic we used was that of we were working on the learning domain of adaptive capacity. We were working to support um, key decision makers. I should say that the target for the tool was actually um, the management agencies, the regulatory agencies, and their co-management committees. We were not necessarily targeting this at the fishing communities. But for those target audiences to be able to recognise change, attribute its change in causes, and assess potential responses. And the logic of social learning is really important because it's about building a shared understanding or convergent direction of learning, recognising that the learning environment we're working in is highly emergent um, and full of uncertainty and constantly changing. So, I'll start with um, tool development. So we essentially ran, developed the tool through two projects. I'll talk about the one on the left first, the blue one, which was actually a response to a federal agency request. And they wanted to know were their management frameworks adept at addressing the climate risks to their fisheries? Were they in fact at risk of not meeting their um, statutory policy objectives or the, the objects of their act? Um, and if they wanted to undertake changes to any of their uh, management frameworks, what process should guide them in determining what to change? Um, so at that federal agency request, our research group co-designed a risk assessment um, tool in, through a series of workshops with that agency. We actually had agency members on our project also. Then we, um, we ran some user testing with case studies, um, and they're the case studies, right? Um, that, uh, that we ran the, the tool with in the first instance. And then we had some um, iteration of the tool based on those, those user test cases. And then we, uh, with that revised version of the tools, actually built an online app for, um, for, to be able to extend and make the tool more accessible. Uh, the interest in this, uh, this suite of tools was high. And as I mentioned, we delivered it primarily and we targeted our Commonwealth Fisheries Management Agency, the Australian Fisheries Management Forum, but there was quite a bit of interest in the uh, application of it at our state agencies, which manage to generalise our inshore coastal fisheries around Australia. So a second project was developed, which I call our Tool Diffusion Project. Um, and in this instance, we were working, we've been working in different regions of Australia. They're the capital cities where the key decision-making bodies at the state levels operate. And we ran three case studies there as well. Um, the Northern Mud Crab, um, a southern rock lobster, and then a suite of west coast demersal species, but I've, I've put the western dewfish in there as emblematic. Um, that has involved training workshops with state agencies to socialise or get them used to the suite of tools that we have and take them through the online app, followed by iteration because we learnt a lot just even in our first initial workshops. Um, then we actually ran in-person risk assessment workshops in situ, which we, had, which we had members of the local science community, regulatory decision makers and industry representatives, recreational and commercial in this instance. And then we're, and we've, we've since iterated the design of our risk assessment workshops quite substantially, both in responding to the needs that um, work, uh, our stakeholders have, but also simply we're learning about this process of undertaking these co-produced risk assessments. Um, and now we're now in the further rollout stage. So the overall logic or design of the actual tools themselves is that we had these kind of axiomatic assumptions about how our system worked. We've got step one um, uh, involves understanding ecological risk, which we understand as climate driven changes to ocean variables expressing themselves in species or ecosystem responses. Then we've got um, an autonomous um, fishing fleet behavioural change response already built in there. And that the way the tool's designed, you could either simply capture autonomous responses, but also desired behavioural changes. And then in our third step, which is fisheries management risk, we actually take account of initial management responses or, or run them through the risk exercise, but also potentially look at further management responses. And that can be in an adaptive management cycle. 
the way it actually works as a risk framework um, is, uh, I'd say it's a mixed method approach to risk assessment, but we essentially derive an ecological risk score which carries into the fisheries risk score and then it, there, it's, uh, the nature of the fisheries risk score can either amplify or dampen your overall risk, which then carries into your management risk score, which can have the same effect of either amplifying or dampening your overall risk assessment score. Um, talking about step one, so the drivers of the ocean properties that are changing, these are the ones that we've captured in our system. And the process of assessing them was largely based on available data, but as I, should, I mentioned, Beth Fulton and Alastair Hobday undertook this stat. So they were able to draw on considerable available information about um, Australian um, ocean properties, changing ocean properties. Um, then with that, we took that information into our ecological responses, where uh, we identified four major domains that we saw as expressing these changes and of relevance to fisheries management. And they were abundance, distribution, phenology and physiology quality. If quality is actually the addition of the fourth column was something that happened in the iteration because we realised that for a number of our fishing um, sectors, they were actually quite concerned about the nature of the product that they were landing and its ability to endure across export or longer um, cold store uh, value chains and supply chains. So this was actually becoming in itself a, 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 a expression of the ecological risk that was relevant. Um, the way that worked actually in our risk assessment, there's obviously a complex risk matrix that sits behind this and that is available online, um, but it's to take those um, is to apply a number of risk factors and then score them against those four areas of, chains of ecological risk. I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, we then moved into step two, which was the potential fisheries responses. Now, this is where all of a sudden you're in a very different data environment. And for some of our fisheries, they're really quite data limited. So we essentially had a set, we, we've pre-prepared from a, a range of, and we drew this from a range of literature, a list of possible responses. They're actually sorted and classified in a more informative way in the tool, but into whether they could be potential responses to address changes in abundance, distribution, timing or quality. And that was actually... Um, and, and then the way that we actually undertook this, this was more like a typical risk assessment where we looked at likelihood and consequence. We actually, uh, in the first instance, drew on expert information simply in the workshop settings and any published literature. But as part of the suite of tools we've developed, we have developed three tiers of types of surveys you could run of your fishing fleet to determine to get them to report their perceived likelihood and consequences of, of undertaking these different adaptation options. And then the way that looked in the risk framework was that we had um, the risk factors were options available, implementation, and then the types of ec economic or social impacts are effectively the consequence. And then that resulted in a fisheries score which you incorporated with your ecological risk. Um, potential management responses, this is stage three. I'm now actually presenting you something from the app because it's just a bit more illustrative and unfortunately it's quite blurry. Um, we again used the same process. We had developed really quite long lists of adaptive potential management responses in response to changes in abundance, changes in distribution, etc. And then they're organised in the app so that you can select them and then once you've selected one, you work through quite a considered process of various scorings against different risk factors. Um, so then in the app you'd like to adjust your total allowable catch for quota species and then you work through time to implementation, change process, implementation cost and ongoing cost. We call that the pathway to impact. Um, and then that's obviously aggregated across all of the management responses you have and then results in your ultimate risk score. So that's the way that all of these come together. Um, it is a fairly simplistic approach. It's the more adaptation options you have, you tend to develop a better score, which doesn't really reflect the, the degree of the impact that these different options may have, but it's a starting place. And we actually found the response from our agencies that they really appreciated having um, management um, responses listed that way in, in line, in, in a direct um, relationship to the type of climate effect that they it could use it to address. So all of this comes together and this is more like a decision support um, mapping process where you can use this, the idea with this assessment, suite of assessment tools that, that they would persist through time, of course be further iterated, but that you may use it or different triggers might lead you to come to use it, including new IPCC reports, um, new reports from your fishers, um, and that or new regulatory requirements for assessment and then that you'd follow this type of um, decision 
um, to a cycle to decide when or when not to use it. So what I really wanted to focus on as much as the tool itself is what have we learned um, from this multi-stage process that's commenced in the year 2016. So the first one is that, um, and I'm drawing quite a bit on the climate adaptation literature here, is that current socio-cognitive conditions matter a lot. Um, our assumption that a set of fairly standard recognisable decision support tools could be brought in, dropped in, introduced into a group of, of uh, policy officers, regulators and fisheries representatives and then run through in a technical sense w was a little naive and in fact we've actually learnt that there's a lot of prior um, learning that needs to go on, social learning I'd call it, and framing to set up the right conditions for undertaking this type of risk assessment. So we found that there were some really strong prevailing norms um, and amongst those we're working with, including that the effects are due to multiple factors, which is true, but it doesn't negate necessarily the need to attend to the climate-driven ones. That responses to climate risk can be, we're used to variability and it's just a bit more and we can handle it, that we, we're, we're confronting that social norm. And that adaptive capacity can't actually be enhanced by management change. It either entirely resides with the industry or that the um, management agency is reluctant to change. So we had why even a kind of a why bother type of social norm operating as well. Um, then, but our team across this period couldn't let not respond to those conditions. So our conclusion is, as I mentioned, socio-cognitive conditions are absolutely critical. Design of workshops contributes to learning and that the redesign of workshops is important to support framing. So these guys found that, for example, looking at climate mitigation strategies really needed to involve um, working with social learning. So I'm going to move really quickly. We're going to, we've found that we need to do a lot of priming in futures thinking. It's absolutely fundamental. It actually needs to start at the start of the workshops or even in pre-workshop processes. Um, this is an example of some of one of the strategies we ran where we actually simply got people to acknowledge the degree of change by talking about things on a personal level and a personal societal level. Um, and that, that actually made a huge difference to the types of engagement we got with um, both policymakers and representatives in the workshops. Um, cognitive overload needs, man uh, needs managing. The people you're dealing with are just looking at many more tactical issues right then and there. Um, and we found that this tool particularly, and in fact the complexity of what you're putting in front of them is a, one of the overload drivers. So we found using impact pathways, a really effective pre-tool to going into the risk assessment. It also helped us actually understand some of the causal relationships that we could then build into the risk assessment. And in some cases we were able to extend them into um, conceptual modelling and in fact qualitative modelling also to support the risk assessment. Um, users need agency and a formal mandate to do this work. Um, it, we, the level of engagement was definitely correlated to whether they just saw it as an explorative first pass, in which case they weren't necessarily highly committed, or whether they were actually, as the, the Commonwealth Agency, sorry, considering building it into the ecological risk assessment framework. So that's an entirely different decision support case, and the level of engagement reflected that too. Um, limited data and emerging understanding is the nature of the game and we actually needed to, to, to teach that if you like, that needed to be stated up front and encouraged that it's okay to learn things wrong and then relearn as new knowledge emerges in these data limited conditions and it will um, and that this multiple passes framework that we built in at the start is a really important one that uh, not having enough data or enough certainty wasn't a reason to undertake a first or second pass using qualitative or expert data of the risk assessment. Um, and the final one, best use of tools varies based on user capacity. And that's just really where you've got to recognise where they're at. But recognising in itself that these workshops were actually a form of intervention. And in fact, having the conversations, the collaborative conversations with scientists, managers, fishers in the room, did some of the necessary social learning work that establishes the preconditions for potentially more effective use of, of technical decision support tools. Um, that's the end of my presentation. We're, we're still iterating, the projects are still live, so if anyone's got any feedback or wants to talk to us about applications or adjustments, um, we're really grateful, it'd be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, for a very interesting talk. Um, I think we've got time for one very, if there's a quick question, a burning question, because we do have some discussion time afterwards. Does anybody have a, a burning question they'd like to ask? Okay, great. If anything emerges, you can catch Emily afterwards. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thanks again, Emily. And I'm going <laughs> to hand over to Lynn for some discussions.
Thanks, Louise. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, it's really, oh, I've just been scribbling in my notebook all, all day. <laughs> um, uh, we wanted to have a, a short discussion session, and then um, we would like to show, um, in about 15 minutes, show um, the theatre production documentary that Astrid mentioned this morning in her, in her plenary. So we'd like to give anyone an opportunity to stay to watch that if they'd like to and, and or discuss with her. But before we get to that, let's just have a little bit of discussion. And I would like to open it for general comments. But before we do that, and maybe just to get you thinking, um, I was wondering if we could perhaps list or identify some key advances that have arisen from transdisciplinary research in terms of how coastal communities are adapting to change, specifically to climate change. So what, what I was thinking of is, and, and a question I had is, for example, are we seeing improved compliance because we are using transdisciplinary research um, approaches? One example. Are we seeing, um, you know, are we seeing more buy-in um, but how is that actually advancing our decision making? So it's all well and good that we we being more inclusive, but what I'm trying to get at is how can we actually pinpoint the advances that are being made? So that was a question to pick your brains on. <laughs> Do we have anyone who feels like jumping in? Louise or Kelly, do you have any gems <laughs> to share? I mean, my question is really, well, do we, do we see, one of the talks this morning was discussing it, do we see improved compliance um, through, through these kinds of studies, or is that not what we're really aiming at? Yes. I guess in a, a room full of probably mostly scientists. I guess when I've done the transdisciplinary work with social scientists and anthropologists, and um, I've actually really valued how much it's influenced me and the questions I'm actually investigating in the quantitative data and how like we'll hear an interview and like, oh, let's, let's sort of look at what, what we're seeing in the data and like, oh, we're seeing this interesting pattern. And then we go back to the communities. And, and so I think it, it actually changes both it changes the whole entity, the collaboration, but also the questions that either of us are answering um, or even asking. And so I guess I, that's, I think, where it's really powerful, that it's not necessarily for a, a particular management outcome, but rather that it's changing the, the nature of the questions and, and what, we're, what we're exploring together. Thank you, that's great. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I would say it, it has been, in my experience, helpful. And I'm actually not a scientist. I work for the Lundfest Ocean Program. We're a grant maker for science. Um, and um, these kinds of approaches have been particularly helpful, in my experience, when you're also working through um, more ecosystem level questions because the scientists are able to work with the stakeholders and managers and be able to work through some of the complexities of the system that that brings into that that brings to bear so an example that i thought of um, a project we funded a few years ago the atlantic states marine fisheries commission which manages state fisheries on the u.s east coast um, was wanting to adopt ecological reference points for menhaden to take into account them as a forage fish for their predators as well as the fishermen who were um, who were fishing them and so they needed an ecosystem level model to help develop those reference points and the project we funded then worked with the commission work with the technical body the commission put together as well as the stakeholders to work through that model and understand how to run that model and understand the connections between menhaden and their ecological relationships and i i mean i can say that model would not have been adopted by the commission if it didn't have that buy-in and it would have taken that so that being able to process through together issues and come to un common understanding um, led to that management decision being made and reference points being adopted. Oh, 
that's a really positive example. Yeah, thanks. It was someone else's hand that I saw floating around. You? Yeah, I think your original question was what is, you know, do we have some tangible evidence of how these uh, interactions have resulted in tangible outcomes? And I think it's, I struggled a little bit because there are a lot of things that go into the effectiveness. And, and so an example of taking up of climate information into management uh, comes maybe in part from these workshops, but it might also come from the fact that people are experiencing these dramatic impacts on their fisheries and their regions. Um, so I think where I see the value of this is in um, from when we started to where we are now in the evolution of those discussions, we have been able to keep pace with our assumptions about what the, the just sort of state of the literacy around climate, the impacts, and, and, and we're not behind as much as we might be if we were in a room by ourselves doing the work. So I see a lot of benefit on the science side and it refines the science towards more actionable and meaningful output. And so we stay valid in a time of a lot of change. In fact, every year it seems like a new crisis. And so we're able to address those, bring those into the discussions. And that has also resulted in discussions at the council's level um, and stakeholders that, that it's not that things can be done, so there could be action taken. So I think the possibility of actions and adaptation as a response to climate change rather than just being impacted by climate change is an outcome of these participatory approaches. So I don't know if that's tangible, but I think it's important. So here you go. Thank you so much. That really, um, I think that really captures the previous two really, really nicely. So yeah, so some good thoughts coming out. Thank you. Any other comments on that or on anything else? Anyone you wanted to chat to ask a question of? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd add too that transdisciplinary approaches have allowed um, experiential um, uh, political, subjective, cultural aspects to actually more systematically be brought into the information system, which they weren't there before. And in doing that, that actually gives them a legitimacy that they didn't have. I think. Um, decision making probably has incorporated that kind of information but in a much more informal and less transparent and probably more problematic way whereas these forms of collaborations across disciplines is showing you can use expert elicitation qualitative data can be really valid and it can be brought into relationship with the other traditional information systems which is a really positive gain Thank you very much. Ah, yes, someone at the back. <laughs> I just <clears throat> had a question that might post to Cisco, or emanated from your talk, Cisco. Um, I just about how we sort of manage the tension between, you know, being more responsive to change in the ecosystem and the desire from our councils in the US, our managers for stability and industry for stability. So for instance, in New England, you know, stability is written into our risk policies that we should be to some degree prioritizing um, that going forward. And should we be setting the expectations for managers that there are gonna be, you know, about this managing under variability, are they gonna expect more year to year um, you know, changes in advice and, yeah. So the question was, um, how do we work with the management on the, you know, in, in anticipation of variability? Sort of like, you know, they, in contrast to the stability that they would like to get. Yeah, that's, that's the ongoing conversation. So I think, and, and actually, Kristen and, or Kirsten and, and Ann and I have talked about this, about perhaps, doing two things in parallel, doing the things the way that we normally do it, and then also perhaps doing what I refer to as a shadow assessment or shadow advice, and slowly compare and learn whether it's really, work, which one's really working better and such. So as we were talking this morning, it's, 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 it's gonna be a process, of, it's gonna be a conversation that we have to have, and, and a learning on both ends. So I think that, uh, you know, if anything, I do see that, that there is that, 
that desire to find a new way of doing things, of modernizing both sides. So I think the dialogue is open and, uh, you know, as, as we plan, whether it's the climate ecosystem fisheries initiatives or, uh, you know, new management approaches and such, um, I would say that the conversation is healthy because it's, I think, I think you just said it as well, Kirsten, it's, it, what we're seeing out there is so obvious and so palpable that, that, that it's no longer avoidable or, or just put aside. So it's, 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 a, it's a good moment to have the conversation. Uh, thank you. I'm just curious about the comment around stability versus uh, certainty. Um, so I'm not sure what the regulatory framework is in Canada, but I think from an industry point of view, which is where I've been coming from in Australia, it's not so much the stability, but it's the certainty, knowing that we might expect big shocks and to be prepared for that rather than it being a flat line stable. So I think businesses generally want to understand that they're what's coming, whether that means it's going to be really rough and ready or whether it's going to be smooth. So it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly stable, but I think managers and managers and uh, decision makers need to at least provide that space for the uncertainty to, you know, to, to pay out, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Any other comments on on this? Or any other questions for anyone? Are there any specific um, critical gaps that we are missing that in the next couple of years we should really, really be directing extra attention to? Or do we feel that the kinds of approaches we're using here are kind of good to go and we're making good progress? I mean, I think we are making good progress, but. Is there anything anyone specifically can think of that we really need to put some concrete effort in? So in five years' time, when we have the next um, ECWO, we, we've identified anything. Thank you. Lisa Colburn from NOAA Fisheries. I think one of the things I've seen is the use of the term transdisciplinary, but what does it really mean? And what do we need to do to succeed at it? I think um, investment in that kind of work and in training for scientists and social scientists to learn how to find that common language will be really important. Thank you, Lisa. Super. Yes. I guess I had a question for the group. In areas where there's been a lot of baggage, I guess, in terms of how scientists and managers have interacted with stakeholders, do we have that? that that's my worry. I'm in New England, it, there's a lot of history. Um, and so I guess, does anybody have any, other than obviously build that relationship, but what if it's sort of a non-starter? I guess, you know, what, are, what are some things that people are thinking about to tackle that? <laughs> any comments on that? Did you have another comment? Are there any direct comments on that? I've tried to capture it. Ah, one at the back and then I'll come to you. Really. I just comment on, because <clears throat> you mentioned New England, I've been doing some stakeholder engagement in New England around uh, climate impacts and um, ground fish stocks and um, we, you know, we get a healthy response from stakeholders. We don't always, we frame it more around change than uh, climate change often. And, um, you know, uh, we do share, we typically kind of share our state of knowledge on what's happening in the ecosystem um, and then open it up for discussion. And so we hear a lot about fish showing up at different times, at different places, um, you know, shifting offshore, um, you know, changes in productivity. Um, and it's not being framed as climate change impacts, um, but I think we have to like kind of listen to the um, where they, you know, where they are in the 
you know, where folks are and the way they want to communicate about it. Um, so I feel like we've had an effective communication there is uh, kind of gathering their information. Um, I'm not sure we're, you know, always having the same conversation about climate change, um, or we're always on the same page there, but. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, one area I'd be interested in, and I'm, it's because I'm an utter pragmatist and come from a small place, uh, is the trade-off between complexity that we need in our decision support tools and systems and simplicity or, or actionable research. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there's an evident case that we need more complexity, even though the challenges are getting more complex, to be able to make the decisions we need for the future we want. And the same question would then go to transdisciplinarity to pick up on Lisa's point. Um, sometimes I think it, we're actually just talking about doing process a lot better with a lot more informed views about how we're doing process. I'm not sure that that's a, an entire tra transdisciplinary research agenda. And it might be a time to become a bit pragmatic about that too. Thank you. I think that's a good point to stop on. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Um, I'd really like to thank everybody, all our presenters. It was a really rich session. Don't run away. Um, I just want to thank everybody first. And also thank you very much for the discussion points and the questions along the way. And hopefully we've captured that and we can feed back after the session. Um, Kelly. Oh, great. Kelly's been taking notes. That's fantastic. So, uh, um, so we will feed back and hopefully develop something from this. Um, but we'd like to offer you the opportunity now, for those of you who'd like to stay, there's a 17-minute documentary that Astrid was speaking about today uh, on an art-based art approach that was used in a South African um, coastal community situation. And yeah, I'd really encourage you, if you have the time before tea, stay for it. It's really worth watching. Thank you. <laughs> Your omstandigheden beperk you where you can eat come. You can buy your omstandigheden eat steak. Zuid-Afrika's reeds historisch benadeelde kleinskaalse vissers ondervind dagelijkse stressors wat hul vermoe om van visvang een volhoubare bestaan te voer nadelig beinvloed. Klimaatsverandering, zwak economische omstandigheden, as ook uitdagings met beleid en regulaties plaas verdere druk op vissers. Die Zuidkaapse interdisciplinaire visserijen navorsingsproject het samenwerking met gemeenschappen bewerkstellig en oor die bestek van 11 jaar probeer verstaan hoe hier die stressors vissers beinvloed as ook hul reacties op veranderende omstandighede. Talle navorsers met verskillende disciplinare achtergronde soos geschiedenis, aardrijkskunde, sociale antropologie, stelselmodellering en marine wetenschappen het op hierdie navorsingsproject saamgewerk. Een van die projecten het gefokus op die ontwikkeling van toekomstsketse of scenario's met die vissers van Melkhoutfontein. Kunstgebaseerde interventies is krachtige communicatiehulpmiddels en kan transformatieve verandering in stelsels bevorder. Dus het hierdie groep navorsers van de Universiteit van Kaapstad met die Rainbow Exchange saamgespan om een muziektheaterproductie op die planken te brengen wat geïnspireerd is door die scenario's. Hier is die verhaal van hoe die samenwerking ontvouw het. Vissermanne in Zuid-Afrika sit baie vast op die oomlik. Die beleid is nie goed vir die kleinskaalse vissers nie. So hulle sien nie altyd die moendlikhede wat daar is vir hulle nie. So ek het besluit om met die scenario's te doen, omdat ek baie graag een gesprek van een probleem na oplossing wil begin verskuif. Scenario's is een baie goeie manier om met onzekerheid te werk, want het geef jou verskillende maniere om te denken aan die toekomst. Als ons dit en dit zo so doen, dan kan dit zo so uitwerken voor 30 jaar. Dit geeft jou manieren om 
amper te kan voorspel wat gaan gebeur onder zekere omstandighede, maar dan om te gaan, oké, okay, ons moet hierdie besluit te maak om by daai een uit te kom waar ons wil wees eindelijk. Na gelang van tyd is vier scenario's saam met die vissers van Melkhoutfontein ontwikkel. Hier die scenario's namelijk, niks het werkelijk verander nie, ons sal met die tyd daar uitkom, dit gaan tans goed en die toekomst is blank, wij so om potentiële toekomstige trajecte uit te lig binnen die contrasterende condities van die dorpse hoofdimensies, namelijk politisch, economisch en die omgeving. Ik het Malcolm van Duin gekies, want ek het my meestersgraad en my ander doktersgraad werk in die Zuidkoop gedoen in die area. En dat is meestal kleinskaalse vissers, hulle werk met die meer commerciële lijnvisserboote van Stilbaar. So, so ek het hulle gekies as een proefstudie. There is a life that a production or a documentary can have that a research paper can't. Research can seem very one-sided. I think research should be working much harder to draw the people we research with into our final products, into a life beyond the interview, a life beyond the fieldwork. And I think this really showed the community how that could be done and that the Cypher project in particular really want to walk that path with them. The part of the process that presented obstacles was every single part of the process. I don't think anything worth doing is ever easy and certainly um, this was not. So we had a very long run up to the ultimate performance in Malcote Fontaine. So how much for opportunity? It's all the victory of the Marius you have made. It is a good thing to do. And by the way, it is a good idea for you to come back. Toe ons die eerste speelvak in Melkhout Fontaine gedoen het, was daar, denk ik voor mij net um, een openbaring. Ik krijg nou nog wonervlees als ik denk aan die ervaring om hier stuk voor daar in gehoor in die gemeenschap te kunnen opvoeren. Alles wat ik is. Dit maakt het totaal en al anders van de productie wat je maar nog niet die tekst vat en je gaat doen het veel maandelijkse inkomsten. Hier wordt je geconfronteerd door die realiteit. So die dynamica het een interessante werksproces gebied. Als we niet moeten verloren, dan kunnen we het aan de bed en de zalver aan. Hoe lang wacht je al gekomen? Hoe lang geleden al die moest gebied? Als die zeepijt is voor mij de totale ensemble piece. En ik heb groot waardering voor het feit dat mensen zoals prof Estrid en Marike that they took the time to, you know, to tell the story. I was very upset when Professor Jaar me had about the project. She had a thought about her students and her further fat. Research can be very dry to an outsider, but then trying to communicate the drama and the data I think really illuminated what we were trying to do. The scenarios is vier verschillende toekomsten, so we all speel amper in parallel af. En dit was een van die groot strijkelblokken wat ons gehad het, hoe hierdie stories wat in parallel loop, wat uh, of 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 is en nie een een en een is nie. Hoe om dit in die narratief saam te flans. Met COVID-19 wat steeds voordeur is daar besluit om die productie in die Baxter Theater te vervullen, om dit so gauw moendlik onder die gemeenschappen te verspreid. We had a very big idea, but I think what was lost in translation was, was communicating how we would actually write these scenarios into a narrative-driven production. And I think a real break came working through the Rainbow Exchange. Ik heb toe voor Christa Davids, wat een bekende Zuid-Afrikaanse acteur is, genader. En Christa was dadelijk maar opgewonden. Dan Christa Davids het het bij makkelijk gemaakt. Hij komt van een academische achtergrond, maar hij is ook creatief. Zo so met een gevolg is, hij kon hij data verwerken en uh, tekst. Toen sloom heeft ons lijkt weer dus die tweede gedeelte van als die zie je bijt was het voor mij oh wow ons gaan bekste theater toen ons gaan optreden 
voor ons als school, voor ons leerders, voor ik als uh, malakoorleer, is het een baie groot voor. Theater het een doel om zelfbeeld te bouwen, om waarde toe te voegen, om uiting te geven aan opgesluite artistieke talenten. Right, here we go. Hey, goed, je leert dat niet. Nice, nice. Hey, kind. So, daarom dan die besluit om professionele acteurs met gemeenschapsacteurs saam te voegen. Bijna blijft met Bayern Johnny. Ha 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 die grootste verrassing en mooiste gedeelte van hierdie project van mij was om dit samen met die gemeenschap te kan doen. Het is niet de eerste keer dat ik met gemeenschap acteurs werk. Nee, ik heb toch altijd gegloeid in empowerment. Dat bekom jij. Hallo, jou van mij. So, uh, jij moet maar net voor hulle gemakkelijk laten voel. Die authenticity wat allemaal net bring naar die productie toe, dat gravitas wat hulle bring, it just went straight to the core. Die is een story, niet wat ons vertelt van mensen, niet maar wat ons samen met mensen vertelt. Ik geloof ook dat door het theater je kan healing uh, voortbrengen en zoveel so opvoeding uh, kan door het theater geschiet. Toen een mens is hier weer opgekrapt wordt, als oude herinneringen naar voren komen. Ik heb besluit om voor die componist Paul Hamner te vragen om ons muziek te schrijven. Zijn we zeker te bij? Aan je gevoel aan Zuid-Afrika, denk ik. Zijn we zeker ook niet uiterst complex? Nee. Je moet muziek hebben wat nog steeds kwaliteit muziek is, maar wat toegankelijk is en die tekst ondersteunt. Ik heb het rechte gevoel dat die muziek die productie op een ander vlak zet. Playing alongside the actors while they are portraying their character or situation or part of the story, I thought it was definitely bringing it to the, to the deeper level. I must be honest, there was one or two items that on stage I had to hold my tears. Even for me as a performer, it was difficult to not get emotional. And then as I the choir Ons hou baie van sing, want dit is ons, ons passie, maar die school sing ons ook baie, <laughs> en ons is lief vir dit. Hulle is rechtig lief vir sing, en hulle het hulle verkyk aan die muzikante wat met soveel passie hulle muziekinstrumente bespeel het. Net die feit dat ek hier kan wees, dat ek in my eie moedertaal kan praat, dat daar een toneel geskiet word in my moedertaal, in een gemeenschap wat telk niet elke dag als jou vertegenwoordig zien opvallen. Ik denk dat dat is fantastisch voor mij. Ik besef niet weer die grote rol wat ik als een kunstenaar heb om voor andere mensen die liefde en die vertegenwoordigheid te geven. Voor ik begin praat, ze zeggen alle groep. Hier is story. Ja, ik kan dit proberen. Dat kan, dat kan ja. beter werken, maar een die acteur zit vroeg. En jullie weer ik besef, weer eens is het een learning curve om voor camera te staan en, en te spelen. Hulle zal definitief die boodschap gaan uitdra op mijn goed fontein van die eerste tijd en die tweede een en die derde tijd. En die plaatsing van die camera so, het open verhelde voor die jonger geslaagd wat hierbij betrokken is. Ons wat kies om elke dag uit te gaan sê toe. Ik meen maar. Dit wat in die vertoning was, dit is wat werkelijk gebeur in Melkroon Tuin as een vosses dorpie. Waar um, Lisbeth haar sien verloor. Dit was baie hardse, dit was baie emotioneel. Waar ga ik mijn losbuit zijn? Waar ga ik mijn losbuit zijn?
op elke visser stort die binnen Zuid-Afrika kry ons um, diezelfde tendens waar mensen gesterf het op die see. Om iemand te verloor wat zo so na aan jou is, jy vergeer het nooit. Dit sal altijd jou bybel heen. The loss of anybody is something that I can relate to. Maar om te denken, dan moet je de volgende dag maar net weer uitgaan. Want je moet dood op die tafel sit. Mense praat nie makkelijk oor hulle leed op die see nie. Maar het bly een werkelijkheid. Dat je wil begrafnis sonder relik. Mense het gevoel partij keer vir die eerste keer dat hulle gesien is. There is a lot to be said for learning and understanding that other people are truly interested in you, your story and in your community. Verliese waarmee hulle partij keer ook moet omgaan dat ons respectvol hee dit uitgebeeld het en in een groot mate a sense of closure partij keer en healing dier dit kon ervaar. Ek is van mening dat hierdie nie die einde is nie. Dit is slechts die begin, of laat ek sê, dit is die einde van die begin. This performance has been intended as a piece of feedback. I think it's also important to note that it's really sparked some some very interesting ideas on how to do research through theatre going forward. And I think we need to embrace that. I don't think it's a choice of either or as one is better than the other, but to start to think of our work on a continuum between these two spaces. The success of this project is the fact that the UCT span, Rainbow Exchange, that there was this constant interchange between academia, the writer and the community. So what that near gepen is, is absolute who it is om op Visser Storpi to play, om uit op die see te gaan, om te wacht vir jou man of seen om terug te kom van die see af. Ek was nog nooit deel van so iets. Die toneel het my halve print gegeef van hoe die mense destijds geleef het. En Lisbeth my maat gevra van Lisbeth die iets van hand het vir die potte asjeblief. En Lisbeth my maat dit gestuur die patatje met paas en tuin op. Dit is na aan merke van tuin, want wat, want wat ons hierbij doen het, dit is die waarde dat op, wat op merke van tuin aan gaan. Er is nou nog mense wat afhankelijk is van die see. Sy hulle nie uitgaan nie, is daar nie iets om op die tafel vir hulle om te eet. You know there is a giving that we shall receive, right? I so be kind of stressed, ma. That's my yelika. My yelna family is trots of my mom, my pa, oh my, oh pa. That's my trots of my. My yelna's with my and Johnny. My yelna's with my and Johnny. You stop. Okay. That's my yelika. You know, you know I so be kind As as when Uncle P said me, I had fit and and I had fit to win. It is a piece that brings hope. It makes the gesprek op for what er mogelijkheden die toekomst kan inhou en hoe ons tussen die navorsing en die gemeenskap self daar die verhoudinge kan bou om uit omstandighede uit te kan groei. Jou omstandighede beper jy waar jy kan uitkom. Die kan boeie omstandig hier uitsteeg. I would like to um, offer anyone who'd like to chat with Astrid to stay behind, um, if she's willing to, 
to chat with us. And, um, and then just open to, to everybody to go and have some tea um, and come back and chat if you'd like to. And I'd really, again, thank you so much for a wonderful session. <laughs>